Good morning. I'm Rebecca Donaldson, facilitating on behalf of Swagelock Northern California. Welcome to the value of pre-engineered subsystems with a technical presentation by Tony Waters and Doug Nordstrom. In addition to this webinar, we're offering an open house from 3 to 7 p.m. today at the Holiday Inn in Venetia. Details are available at norcal.swagelock.com. Tony and Doug will present for about 30 minutes and then answer your questions. We plan to wrap up about 10.45 a.m. Please do jot your questions in the WebEx chat box, including your name if you'd like your question attributed. We may also answer questions in a follow-on article at the website. And we are recording this session. We anticipate offering a link to replay it, along with a copy of the slide deck. I'll introduce the two experts leading this session, Tony Waters, who has 30 plus years experience working with industrial process analyzers. He helps refiners and chemical processors optimize their use of process analyzers. Today, Waters is Process Analyzer Consultant at Analyzer Consulting Engineers, LLC. Previously, he led divisions of Zertex, Exxon Chemical, and Foxborough, among others. Doug Nordstrom is Market Manager for Analytical Instrumentation for Swagelock and focuses on advancing the company's involvement in sample handling systems. He previously worked in new product development for Swagelock and earned a number of Swagelock patents for products. Doug, please get us started. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Rebecca. What we would like to do this morning is talk about a new concept in how to build process analytical sample systems that we refer to as PRESS. And then I will hand this off to Tony Waters, uh, who will go through the five different PRESS products that we currently have, and then we'll end this with a question and answer session. So what PRESS stands for is pre-engineered subsystems, and what we're trying to do with the PRESS uh, methodology is turn systems or subsystems into products. And what that means is that we want to proactively engineer, assemble, and test these subsystems or products to take advantage of producing them in higher production so that we can uh, bring them to the market at a more cost effective and higher quality rate. It's really ideal for repeat applications in the typical online process analyzer systems. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. These are standard configurations that Tony will review, and then we've also engineered in some anticipated options to help meet a wide range of customer applications. And what we're doing is we're replacing the time-consuming uh, one-off engineering uh, subsystem design to create a standardized product feel. Really, the business need that we're addressing with Press is to create a higher quality system pre-engineered and more readily available for the market. This includes design layout consistency, just as to be expected with any other product that we would go to market with. And we want to be able to offer this the lowest possible installed cost. And we do this through the higher volume approach of a standardized subsystem. Uh, we're able to bring these to the market or bring these to the user faster, uh, more, efficient, more efficiently, because we have off-the-shelf components Everything included in a press subsystem is all inventoried and ready to be built and shipped out the door. And then, of course, like with any other product, we have fully trained field engineers, sales associates, and distributor centers. As with anything else, we warranty our press products, and that with this includes all the products included in the press, all the discrete components, and also all the uh, service and labor included inside it receives the full typical lifetime swage lock warranty. And then with any major purchase, uh, such as an autom automobile, you receive a user's manual. With a press product, you also receive a user's manual that teaches the user how to put the system together, uh, how to do maintenance, how to do any troubleshooting, and how to do any uh, pressurizing or depressurizing of the system. And again, the, the press service level, we want to feel like any other component offered by swage lock. So the basic way that these systems were done in the past and still many times today, these are engineered using discrete components following a P&ID layout where each discrete component is placed and connected to the next discrete component. Now, this can be very time consuming and it's very difficult to do correctly. And one typical example here, we have a four process stream system with two analyzers can very easily have 43 isolation valves, 40 switching valves, and so on down this line, uh, to where you see at the very bottom that this particular 
unit has 135 separate individual part numbers uh, included in this system, which is a lot to engineer and lay out. And uh, also included in this is approximately 54 hours of uh, man hours of assembly work, which is a considerable amount of time. With the press methodology, what we're trying to do is identify the repeat units within that uh, online process system and say, how can we make one unit and repeat it within that uh, particular sample panel so that we can take advantage of uh, repeat engineering? So what we've done here is identify the repeat units. We can identify those as a press, a standardized subsystem, and we cut down considerably on the number of part numbers. And as you can see, using this press methodology, instead of 135 part numbers, we can cut this down to 17 very, very easily. And the 54 hours assembly becomes simply connecting one press unit to the next press unit. And that is reduced to only six hours of assembly for this full four-stream sample system. So again, we would like to make press as easy to use as any other Swagelock product. So what we've done in order to do this is we've done a lot of pre-engineering. Everything is engineered uh, during the product development cycle. And this then comes with a warranty from the factory, a manual, and a troubleshooting guide as a standard offering. Uh, there's easy to follow catalogs just like with any other product. And at the end of the catalog, there's a single part number that identifies all the different configurations, the flows, the pressure ranges, and any other features, which Tony will review here in a little bit, that are included in that single subsystem. As with any other product, we have uh, pre-established pricing so that every single time that uh, subsystem is quoted, it receives the same pricing, and all the components are on the shelf so it receives a very fast delivery. Our target for any subsystem is fully uh, quoted, assembled, tested, and out the door within four weeks. And like with many of our products, uh, something that's unique to the press subsystem is that we can pre-validate performance testing so that we understand exactly the pressure drop or exactly the flow rate that we'll receive with any of the part numbers in our catalog. Now I'd like to turn this over to Tony and he will go through the initial five press units offered by SwageLock. Hello, everybody. This is Tony Waters. Nice to be with you today. What we're going to do now is to look at four, uh, five of these different press units and see what they are and how they work and uh, how you would use them in, in a sampling system. So we've got uh, these five listed here. We'll take one, one at a time. Start off with the sample probes, relatively simple. <clears throat> the probe itself, of course, is, is quite simple. I'll show you a picture of one of those in a moment. But more interesting, perhaps, is the valve that we've developed to go along with those probes. This valve allows you to um, block and bleed the, the sample in, and it does, does so in a way that, that uh, is interlocked so that you can't really make mistakes. For instance, if you look down below, you'll see that there's a bleed valve to, to the left of, the, of each picture there. And if you look at the cam that's connected to it, you'll see that you can't turn that valve because it's, it's, it's jammed against the other one. It's not until you turn the main valve off that you can, in fact, open the bleed valve. So this method of interlocking valves um, saves mistakes being made and increases safety and also gives us another feature with the retractable probe which we'll look at in a moment. <clears throat> so we have retractable probes, uh, we have fixed probes. The retractable probes tend to be tubing and uh, they come in sizes from about a quarter inch up to a half inch. And the fixed probes tend to be pipe and they also go up to about half an inch and down to a, a little bit less than a quarter. So we have a whole range of different uh, possibilities in the probe. You'll notice that each probe has a little symbol on it uh, which indicates the actual end cut on the probe. So when the probe is in position, you can still t tell, you can check to see that the, that the end is facing the right way, which in sampling is normally downstream, although there are some cases where upstream uh, pointing might be possible or even an advantage. And next to the probes, you can see the, the valve unit that goes along with it. And the fixed probe one, um, we already had a quick look at. The retractable one 
in some ways is a little bit more interesting. Let's see how that works out. <clears throat> Here's the Fix Pro 1, uh, which uh, simply has the, the bleed valve and the secondary block valve there. You can see the bleed valve is interlocked with the primary block valve. And in the position shown, the, the, the valve is on, uh, the sample is coming out, and you can't open the bleed valve. It's, uh, the cam there prevents it. Of course, by rotating the primary block valve, that releases the, the bleed valve. Uh, that scoop you see in the side there is is what does it as it turns around into the other position. So uh, they're interlocked in such a way that you can't uh, you can't turn the bleed valve on while the main valve is on, and you can't turn the the other the other way around. You you have to turn the bleed valve off before you turn the main valve back on again. So a little bit of uh, safety conscious design there. The Retractable probes, if you if you like to use them, not everybody does, but uh, some people like to use retractable probes. And if you do, uh, one of the big uh, problems has always been that operators tend to close the, the valve, the, the, the isolation valve, and that can crush the probe completely, sometimes making it difficult to get the probe out. <clears throat> now you'll notice in this case we've got a similar situation, except there's an extra valve down there, which is the probe lock valve. and uh, I'll show you how that one works. Uh, again, things are interlocked. And in particular, in this case, the, the main interlock here is that you can't, you can't shut the process valve unless you draw the probe out. <coughs> Otherwise, you can't crush the probe. So looking at some of the ways this works, uh, if you look at the first diagram here, you'll see the probe is just entering the valve. You can see it at the top, the blue tube. It's uh, just starting to go in. And uh, you can't get it in right now um, because the valve is closed, of course. So you have to open the main valve here. That uh, that lets the probe valve open. And you can push the probe then straight down. Now, of course, before you open the main valve, you, you would have to make sure the bleed valve was closed. <clears throat> Once you push the main the probe right down there, uh, if we go to the next page, you'll, you'll see that um, you, you can't actually close that uh, that probe valve because the probe is passing right through it. So if you try to pro change that, if you try to uh, close the one marked in red there, you can see by, by the small insert at the side there how, how it blocks it. You'll notice how we've machined the openings there so that the probe is not placed under a, a too much stress. Uh, if it were just a hole, it would be like a knife cutting through the probe. But uh, here we've got a definite bearing spot. And also the handle is very small, so you can't get much torque on it. So if you try to turn that uh, that handle when the probe's in, it, it won't go. And since it won't go, you can't operate the other two valves either. Um, so what you have to do is you, you withdraw the probe from the process, bring it up to the top, and, and then you can open the probe valve, and then you can open the main valve, or close it rather, close the main valve. And only then can you open the bleed valve to bleed off the pressure. So everything's interlocked, and it stops that uh, problem that we've had in the past of probes being squashed by people closing the valve. <coughs> so we think this is quite a big improvement in uh, what has been done in the past. Let's look at the second of the press units, which is the field station module. It's perhaps one of the simplest ones of, uh, of, the, of the set. Um, here is a picture of one of the units. Uh, as you can see, there's a big case there. Uh, this one has, uh, has a case that raises up, and that's the way it's shown right now. And there's an interlocking device that, that locks it in that position so you can work on it and then put it down afterwards. The reason for having these, um, these field stations is to drop the pressure of gas samples, mo mostly anyway. And that's what uh, is shown here. The idea of dropping the pressure of a gas sample um, is that if you do it at the probe, it will be much faster than doing it uh, at the analyzer location. For instance, if you look at the top diagram here, um, you can see because the line is under great pressure, you've got lots of uh, molecules there, many gas molecules uh, in the line, lots of them. And obviously, to, to get a new sample through from the plant, we'd have to remove all these old ones. And since there's so many of them, that would take some time. 
So if you drop the pressure first, which is shown in the second diagram, then you have less molecules in the line. And if there's less molecules in the line, we can, we can remove them much faster. It's a, perhaps a bit paradoxical that that's the case, that dropping the pressure actually makes it much faster. But it's true, if you do that at the, at the same, at a given flow rate, half the pressure gives you twice the speed. So it's a good idea to put uh, regulators up at the tap, and the, the main purpose of the field station module is to allow you to do that. Now, there are quite a few options available, but there are other simple ones, so we decided not to just go through them all. Ma mainly, we have block valves, we have a filter or a coalescer, we have various kinds of regulators that one could use, and also various positions for, for pressure gauges that you may or may not have uh, or want. <laughs> for instance, in this case, the drawing shows the P12 there, which is a non-preferred position because it's a pressure gauge at high pressure, and that causes a bit of delay. But some people do like to have it there, so we provide it as an option. The P11 gauge, of course, is necessary because that's the one that's, um, that's actually measuring the, the pressure coming out of the, the pressure reducer. That's what you set your regulator at. <clears throat> so there, there are many different options here, um, but it's really just recombinations of filters, coalescers, valves, and pressure gauge. So if, if you need to know, you can look at the literature um, and, and choose one. <clears throat> This slide shows that there are quite a few different ways that you can protect your field station module in the field. Um, clam case types and overhead types and just a simple sun shield. Many different things that are available from Swagelot to, to do that for you. So that was our field station module. And uh, what I'd like to do now is to go ahead and look at the fast loop module. Fast loop module is quite an interesting one. Um, fast loops are used um, mainly with liquid samples because uh, liquid samples, you have to take the sample back and put it back in the process again. Although gas samples too sometimes use fast loops, so it's not exclusive. And for that reason, we, we actually produce two versions of the fast loop module. There's a half inch version, which is for the higher liquid flows and the, the heavier liquids. And there's the quarter inch version, which is suitable for lighter liquids and for gases. So you'll, you'll see that in the catalog, that choice is up to you. <coughs> they, the, they're built pretty much the same, um, so they, they look very similar to each other. Here's a picture of one of them. You can see that everything is fully assembled and ready to go. Interestingly, we've been able to, by doing it this way, we've been able to, to remove a, quite a lot of fittings. In fact, you, you might notice if you look closely, there's a few welded joints there. And we've constructed uh, connectors to do the job. And this is possible because of the standardization. It's not something that you would do in a, in a custom fabrication, but uh, with a standardized system, you can see that it, it's quite possible to create uh, a welded joints. And also, the other thing that we've done here is we've used some VCR fittings, which enables you to take components out. So for instance, if you want to take a filter out or a valve out, you don't have to disconnect everything. You just pull it straight out. The, once you undo the nuts, it's clear to come out. There's zero clearance, basically. So a couple of features there that you wouldn't necessarily see in a fabricated system. Now, if you look on the right there, you'll see uh, another feature of the fast loop module is this uh, this control module almost here, which uh, is uh, is one that turns two ball valves at the same time, and it does it potentially at least twice. Uh, the, the black one there is the main control, which is turning two ball valves um, both together, and those are special ball ball valves we'll mention in a moment. Um, but they, they're your main bypass lines so that you can turn your valve to a bypass condition. And once you've done that, um, it, it releases the, the other control, the red one, uh, which cannot be operated if you don't turn the ball valves to bypass. You don't want to be turning that one when you're on main line because that one is the purge control. So you turn your, your main line into bypass and then you can uh, use the other one to control perch. Now, not every system has that because we have uh, four different options here. Let's have a look at the options that we've got. Um, firstly, the first one, a very simple thing, 
uh, a fast loop system which has a couple of ball valves which are interlocked as we just saw. And also those ball valves have a very special um, plug of a hole in the, in, in the ball basically. It's arranged so that as you turn the ball, it never actually turns the line off. It, it, uh, in the mid position, all, all connections are connected together there. All ports are connected together. And the reason for this is if you use a ball valve on a fast loop system, you're shutting down a liquid that's traveling rather fast. And you can get tremendous water hammer pulses. Uh, even at a standard speed of one meter per second, you, you can get pulses of up to about 15 bar of pressure. So it, it's quite a big pulse, and it can blow up your pressure gauges and make a real mess of things. And so in order to stop that happening, we, we've uh, developed this special valve which does, in fact, uh, divert the flow without shutting it down. So by operating that valve, then you divert the flow into a bypass, which is the line in between. And what that does is it releases the rest of the system for maintenance purposes. <clears throat> now, in this case, there's, there's no uh, purge arrangement, but that's available as an option. And in this case, uh, this particular diagram we're looking at right now, you'd have to take it apart to, to maintain it. Now, when it's on, when it's online and running, of course, you won't be in the bypass mode. You'll be coming down through the, the inlet line there to the red uh, fast loop filter. That, that's a tornado type filter that gives you the, 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 the good filtration in the fast loop. The fast loop flow, of course, doesn't go through the filter element. It just goes round and out, and uh, it goes up to the rotometer, um, which is an armored unit, and, and then takes it out to, to the vent there. And then the line to the analyzer, of course, is the filtered flow, which is a much lower flow than the, than the fast loop flow. <clears throat> now, we have another n number of options that we can, uh, we can offer you for, for this. And again, all these options are standardized, so you can order them just by putting a number in the model code, and out, out will pop the right answer. So every, everything is pre-engineered, and it's waiting for your order. So con configuration number two is a very simple addition. It, you may wish to bring the sample from the analyzer back into your fast loop. Um, <coughs> excuse me, this is particularly useful for liquid samples um, where you've got pressure. You come back with pressure, you go through a check valve, and you, and you pass it back to the fast loop return line there. This, this, of course, is possible because there's a needle valve at the top of the diagram there, which is causing a pressure drop. And that pressure drop is what's pushing the sample through the filter, through the analyzer, back through the check valve, and back into the return line. So a very simple addition. If you want to use it, um, you would just specify it. If you don't, then that's OK, too. You, you don't have to have it. All these options are, are independent, so you can choose which ones you want. <clears throat> Some other options that there are. Um, what you might be interested in is, first off, uh, in this case, uh, we have a simple drain system. Um, it does require you have some gravity drain uh, effect here, and, and so there's nothing actually pushing the stuff through. The one below is a little bit more useful in some regards, I think, and that is where you bring nitrogen in or, or a purge liquid in, and you just purge it through the entire system and out again. And uh, those again, those are two. Those are two options that are available to you. And the the advantage of this, of course, is that you can in fact get liquids or gases out of the parts before you maintain them. Particularly the filter, changing the filter element, it's always a good idea to be able to purge out the the gas or liquid that's in it before you break the seals and uh, go inside. It's much safer that way, and it's nicer for the operators uh, to do the job. <coughs> So those are the options that we have with our fast loop module. There's, there's four of them right there, uh, giving you some picture of the different degrees of complexity. And as you can see, it's the same thing. Uh, we, we've just got to things, basically we designed the most complex bit, and um, then we took parts out to give you various options of having them or not having them. So four different models there, and also there's the, uh, the quarter inch one and the half inch one, which gives you two versions too. Number four in our list is the calibration and switching module, which um, is basically the, the modular system that we have, the MPC modular system that Swayjot produced. But it, it's put together in, in a way that you can order it in one go rather than having to 
specify everything yourself. Essentially, we're looking at a number of different switching, uh, switching inlets here. And um, you may have um, only two, perhaps. On the other hand, you might have six, like, like this model shows here, or even more. And the inlet uh, side of the, of the thing is shown on the, on the left-hand side there. And uh, there are various kinds of inlets that you can actually have. And in fact, there are five different models of, of the inlet assembly there. I'm just going to go back one slide. No, it's not there. Okay, sorry. Um, here we see uh, um, the top ones just have a very simple um, shutoff valve and a filter. And then on, on the mainstream valves down below, you, you can have filters, you can have regulators, um, gauges. And so there's a number of different inlet assembly. They're all standardized so that you can order them very simply um, just by specifying the part number you want. And then, of course, that they go into the switching valves, which are on the right, and uh, everything is color coded in this drawing. The, the, the orange ones there are calibration streams, and the blue ones are process streams. Up at the right, there's a manual calibration uh, valve, which enables you to switch manually. All that does is switch the SSV valve on manually. The SSV valves are the valves that switch the streams. There's six. I think there's six of them there, isn't there? Yeah, there's six of them in that picture. So there's a tremendous number of different options here because uh, you can really configure any kind of inlet system that selects as many streams as you want. And you can condition each stream coming in in whichever way you want to condition it. So there's also ARV options, which enable you to, to um, vent your pr process chromatograph the atmospheric balancing system for process chromatographs that's built in there too. So there's, there's a lot of different options here in, in this unit. The big advantage is that you just fill in the part number and the whole thing turns up um, completely assembled. You don't have to worry about anything. We try to make it easy for you. This is the SSV unit and uh, that is used in that system. You're, you might be familiar with it already. It's available both separately uh, as, a module, as a modular unit in its own right and also as part of the SSV module. Um, little diagram to the right there is animated so you can see it go up like this. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how it switches. That, that, that is now on. And uh, I guess we can switch it off again. Yeah, there we go. Switch it off again. And when it switches off, the inside part is vented, which is the double block and bleed. The, the blue part you see there goes off to the vent. So it vents out between the two shutoff valves. So basically, we block the stream in two places and vent it in the middle, a very classic sort of uh, double block and bleed system. <coughs> This is the one I was uh, looking for a moment ago. Um, th this shows, uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the number of different options. The first one just has a valve, and then a valve and, and a gauge, and then a valve and a filter and a gauge, and a valve and a pressure relief valve and a gauge, and then we've got a regulator in the last one. So th these five options are available, and, and they just slot right into the blue, the, the blue components on the, on the left on, on the plate above. So a number of different options there, um, very easy to order, and you don't have to do any design work at all. It's all been done for you already. Nice. Finally, we've got the fluid distribution header, which is probably the simplest of all things. Um, it's simply a header, that's all. <laughs> but it's a very popular one. It's one of the most popular ones that we make, in fact. There's a tremendous number of variations of this, but basically it's effectively a pipe, although it's a very special one. As you can see, it's, it's a special, is that a casting or an extrusion? That's an extrusion, isn't it? Yeah, special extrusion. And um, it's built to be drilled and tapped so that we've got these um, positions where we can put things. And the valves can be in different orientations, and there's a whole lot of different models here. You can have different lengths of, of the module, and or you can even connect one module to another module and make it longer. And you've got different types of valves you can use, and they can either stick out one side or, or both sides or, or whatever you want in any dimension you like almost. 
So it's a very versatile little header and it says it solves a very simple problem that how how do you feed it a number of different points from, from one, like with steam or, or with air, um, even with carrier gas. So how, how do you how do you actually split those off to the different uh, users? This is a very easy way to do it. <coughs> There's some examples of our of our header unit, and you, you can see some of the options coming out there, depending on how, how you'd like it. But on a long header, you just simply connect two together, and then you make it as long as you like, three together, four together. You can actually run down the, the whole side of an analyzer house uh, with these, and not necessarily with so many valves as this, but uh, you get to choose how many valves you have, so, so that's the on the advantages here. And that's the end of our technical presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Doug. We're now going to turn to taking some of your questions. The first question, if we want to customize one of the pre-engineered subsystems beyond what's detailed in the catalog, is that possible? If so, how would we go about specifying the customization? Yes, it's a question we get quite often, actually, because what we find is that even with a lot of the options that we do have in the catalogs, it, uh, there always are uh, many ideas beyond that. And we do that on a, re on a fairly regular basis. I would say at this point, uh, about 25% of our sales are actually outside of the standard catalog. And um, our Swage Lock uh, representatives at Northern California can help submit those requests to the Swage Lock factory. And, and then we, uh, we need to do a special quote for that, but it's something that's very simple because we have a good starting point with the current press unit. Second question, what is a typical lead time on a fast loop module? The lead time goal for us with any catalog item is four weeks. Uh, and we achieve that by stocking all the parts, including the plates, uh, the schematic uh, blocks, the, the brackets, everything. And then, of course, all the components are, are swage lock components. So if it's a catalog item, we hit the four-week target. If it is a special, uh, like I just mentioned, uh, we typically average about six, but it depends a lot on what the special is. Third question, can we specify non-swage lock components if needed? Yeah, another very popular question we receive is um, standard uh, questions about replacing our, our product selection with other products. And that is something that we do uh, quite often. Um, we would not do it on every product or any product within the press unit. For example, if a competitive fitting was desired, we would, we would uh, require that the fittings included would be swage lock, but we do uh, agree to change out some of the some of the other discrete components for some standard or um, more typical products used at that end, end user site. Thank you. Tony, anything to add? No, they all seem to be questions about the uh, Swage del delivery process, so uh, I don't have anything to say about that. <laughs> okay, good. Do you have plans for expanding this offering to include other subsystems? Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, we we got. <laughs> we, we we have we have we have dreams, of course, which um, we've identified um, something like 20 possible um, modules here. Of course, it's very unlikely that we would actually produce 20 modules, but. Um, well, our goal basically is eventually to have just the right number of modules that we can create entire sampling systems with nothing else required. You just connect the modules together and that's the end of it. That that will be our ultimate goal, but uh, for the moment, uh, I think that it's true to say that uh, every year or so you're going to see another little flock of modules appear. Uh, we're working on one right now, but I don't think I, I can say. <laughs> um, <laughs> So <laughs> we will definitely be having additional modules. And the whole idea is that modules will be compatible with each other so that you can, in fact, just connect them together rather simply to make complete systems. That's, that's the whole, whole idea of this. 
Good. And we'll try to offer this group access to a technical briefing on future ones um, as they come available. Indeed. Yeah. So there are more questions here, and I want to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time and wrap up by the appointed time, which was 1045. Please do watch for more answers to be posted at the NorCal blog, which is at norcal.swagelock.com.